Uh, we're uh, starting, this is uh, the first official session of our bioinformatics for infectious disease program. Um, we are um, starting today on May 4th, and this program is going to have several uh, sessions like today. Uh, there are going to be different types of sessions. There are going to be more informational sessions where um, we will do, uh, we will have different speakers covering different subjects and doing some hands-on analysis, and then we'll do some Q&A sessions. Well, you will be able to ask any questions and we'll focus on the types of problems and challenges that you have as you go through the program. At the end of this uh, month, we're going to also provide enough time for everyone that wants to work on their own uh, bioinformatics projects to actually apply some of the skills that you've learned throughout the program to a data set of your choice. But in this program, we're focusing on bioinformatics for infectious diseases. So that includes viruses, bacteria. Um, we won't touch on other uh, pathogenic uh, sources, uh, but we will focus on a couple of examples, a few examples. Coronaviruses, Ebola, rhinoviruses, flu, tuberculosis. Uh, so uh, the viruses that we hear about a lot and some bacterial infections as well. So the goal of this program, just to kind of give everybody an overview, is to understand some of these pathogens and the diseases that they cause. Um, we'll talk a lot about different um, animal hosts uh, where um, a lot of the adaptation of these viruses and bacteria happens before they actually uh, come and infect and cause these kinds of diseases and pandemic outbreaks. We'll talk about viral evolution replication. So what do those processes include? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about bacterial infections. As you know, viruses infect bacteria. Um, and so that interaction between bacteria and viruses are important for us to understand viral evolution and replication. And then uh, hosts like animals and humans have a lot of bacteria. And so uh, viruses um, and bacteria and humans or hosts, animals are an ecosystem. So we'll talk about that. And we'll talk about um, data. So this is a program focused on bioinformatics. So we'll talk a lot about data and the primary type of data that we'll be talking about is next generation sequencing data. In fact, this session today is dedicated to an overview of next generation sequencing data in application to um, these types of problems. Uh, what types of analyses will we talk about? We'll talk about the different strains and haplotypes and so specificity, identifying exactly what is the pathogen that we are, um, uh, that is causing disease. Um, we'll talk about how to characterize uh, novel viruses by looking at uh, similarity and uh, differences. We'll also talk about the um, metagenomic communities, so the microbiome, and uh, how composition and uh, differences in the microbiome are associated with different infectious diseases. We'll talk about vaccine design, antivirals, and antibiotic or antiviral and antibiotic resistance. Uh, what are some of the next generation sequencing uh, data types and uh, bioinformatics analysis methods that are used to um, study that kind of resistance. Um, and we'll also talk about um, different specific projects and data sets that will help illustrate some of the methods of analysis that we discuss um, in general um, in a specific use case. So uh, we'll focus a lot on the epidemics um, like Ebola, Zika, and Dengue or uh, rhino uh, virus and uh, enterovirus uh, D68. Uh, so we'll talk a few about a few different examples. Um, and we'll also talk about some of the, um, some of the long-standing epidemics like tuberculosis, for example, um, where there are other types of problems that um, are caused by the way we treat these diseases. So before we go into today's session, and the topics uh, related to next generation sequencing, I do want to make sure that everybody understands the registration process. And if you are already registered, you know where to find the different resources that we're gonna be referring to in, in this session today. 
um, and we'll try to eliminate any kind of confusion or um, you know, uh, make sure that everybody has all the links and is able to access everything. Or if you're not, uh, then you know how to get there. So uh, I'll do a brief overview. I do want to mention that we dedicated a whole session to this last Friday. And we do have a recording um, of that session that uh, perhaps Bipshek can place in chat for anyone that's interested to um, understand all of the topics that we're talking about here today um, as an overview of the program and what um, is the process of registration and all of that. We'll have a link here in a few minutes in chat for you to review. So first of all, um, just briefly, there's going to be a registration page where you have to fill in your details. Uh, we ask their information uh, like uh, your name, email, um, contact information, uh, location, and things like that. And so based on that information, we then email you a link where you can register for free on the um, portal that we run, an educational portal. Uh, so you will have to um, register by creating a username that is going to be associated with your email address. Um, and then that free account is what could be added to this program. Uh, the program is paid and there's a link on how to complete your registration. Uh, we don't expect everybody who is interested in bioinformatics to want to pay for this program. So if you do want to just refer to some of the free re resources that we have, we have that as well. Uh, so make sure that you uh, create an account. You can find some of the free resources, um, and create a demo account on the platform that we'll be using today. Um, and you can still benefit from learning like that. If you do want to join the program, uh, make sure that you are looking for uh, this kind of an email after you complete the registration form. Um, and in this email, there's going to be a few links on how to actually do that. And so that was the first uh, webinar that we did to cover the program overview. And then today we're actually starting the program, but we're going to keep the registration open until the end of this week. Uh, the reason is because some people um, had different, um, um, were not ready uh, to complete the registration. And so we want to make sure that we provide a good overview before we close the registration by the end of this week. So for those of you that did register, um, I want to make sure that you have all of your login information. So there's going to be two different logins. And one of them is for server tbio.info. This login information is emailed to you. Um, those of you that registered today might not have gotten that, uh, that um, login information just yet. Uh, it will take up to 24 hours uh, for you to get that information. Um, and then here, as I mentioned, you register for free. And uh, you will see some free resources here. So just make sure that you have this information. If you don't, you can reach out to Bipsha, uh, whose email is marketing at pine.bio. So if you have any questions about registration, uh, please ask her to help. The program, and I'll do a little review of those of you that already registered for the program, what are you going to expect to find? So um, there is a link. Uh, let me in fact go there. Um, on this link, you will find a lot of relevant information for what we're going to be doing throughout the program. Um, so if you go to the main portal, which is edu t bioinfo let me place that in the chat. Okay, so that's the main portal. Um, and in this portal, you'll be able to go under events and you'll see bioinformatics for infectious diseases. So that is the program that we're going to be uh, talking about today. So please uh, go to this link. And uh, once you're logged in, you should be able to see what I am seeing on my screen. And that includes primarily the schedule. So you'll see here um, the schedule for this uh, program by navigating this outline. 
and you can also see a lot more detail uh, related to the program right here. So we started talking about this last time. There's going to be a forum for questions. So if any of you have questions for us to answer or for other participants to answer, you can post your questions there. That's also where we're going to be posting recordings from previous sessions. Um, so make sure to check that out. And uh, for those of you that are not joining the uh, live sessions, you'll be able to see all of the review material here. And you can see that Beepsha already posted here a welcome message. There's going to be another tab. Uh, those are courses for the participants of the program. Um, all of these courses are free. Um, they're not required, but they will help you get a sense of the different types of projects and uh, analyses that we will be covering in this program. And there's also going to be projects, progress, assignments, and here you'll find a number of other uh, uh, useful links um, that we'll discuss here in a few minutes. Okay, so an important part of it is just to make sure that you have your login and you've completed your profile registration. If you go to members, you'll find a list of the members that have joined already, and then you'll be able to register and then you'll see your name and profile here. Um, I don't want to you know, highlight anyone just yet, but I do want to mention that some of you uh, have completed uh, your profile. What's important in completing your profile is actually making sure that you have, um, and sorry, Kevin, uh, I'm going to highlight your profile because you were able to complete a lot of the, um, a lot of the information about you. Uh, so uh, what's important is to have your full name. Um, that will uh, appear on your certificate at the end of the program. So it's important that it's not, you know, new guide 24 or some kind of a weird name. So please fill out your full name. Uh, we also um, encourage you to complete your profile with your picture or links to your social media um, and in, even information about yourself. And that will help us to um, know who you are and, and uh, make sure that our materials are appropriate for, um, for your interests. So I, I ask everyone that already finished their registration and joined the program to please finish your profile. Uh, that will help us as well. Now, as I mentioned, there are going to be courses and projects. Uh, these are going to be somewhat dynamic. So we're going to be adding some new resources here. And you'll see uh, some things appearing and they say coming soon. Uh, throughout the program, as we get to that point, they will become available for the members of the program. And um, we already added two of these. Uh, today, I'll be doing a little bit of an analysis from this project. Uh, which you'll be able to uh, start working on after the session. Uh, it's also a free project, so anyone that's not a, a part of the program can just explore that project and understand how things work. Um, so you'll see uh, some material there. Overall, uh, once everyone starts doing the projects or working on courses, completing those courses, we will be able to understand the dynamics of this group, and we'll be able to assist you as you go through the material. So um, we are trying to develop uh, a number of tools to help you get through the material and understand both the theoretical aspect of what we discuss as well as the practical. So we will be able to track that kind of activity. Um, we have a progress tab for the members of the group, and we'll be focusing on the members of the group uh, and every week discuss uh, the uh, completion of course material, which is going to be in yellow, and the practical assignments, which, which will, I'll show an example today of a practical assignment uh, that you'll be able to complete. Uh, we do that by looking at points. Uh, um, so you see here is going to be a list of all the participants and there's going to be some point system. And so how, do, how are these points calculated? For completing a course, you get 500 points. For running a pipeline, you get 100 points. For updating your profile, you get 100 points. And for group activity, you get 10 points. Uh, here, we obviously just measure your completion of courses and running pipelines. And what we are generally interested in is to make sure that you 
develop a good sense of not only the theoretical material that you can read practically anywhere, uh, today there's a lot of free resources to do that, uh, but also you know how to apply those tools to a specific challenge uh, that we first uh, explain and propose as an exercise, which is going to be an assignment, and then learn how to apply that uh, to your own problem statement. So um, in the end, we also hope that some of you are going to be um, advanced enough uh, to be highlighted after this program is completed. And the benefits of that is that we believe that all of you, or maybe some of you are interested to not only learn about these skills, but also become a part of a community, a community that is interested to uh, work together on bioinformatics projects, perhaps um, you know, you're interested to get hired by uh, developing bioinformatics skills. So we have a dynamic community of thousands of participants of previous programs and other contacts that we have in different universities and research labs. Um, and there's a, a high demand for bioinformaticians. So um, if you're highlighted, we share that information with our whole network of over 10,000 contacts. And we hope that um, that will be um, useful to you as well. So to look at some of the previous participants that have been highlighted, uh, they're right here on the leaderboard. And we also have a few blog posts where we talk about um, these uh, different uh, members of different programs that we've run in the past. Okay, so before I continue, I want to make sure that I've answered any questions that you might have about the program, the program structure, or if you have um, you have any question about some of the login information. So if you have any of those questions, uh, please put those in chat. Um, and someone from our team will actually answer um, those questions. Okay, let me just check. Okay, um, we need to complete all the courses and paid additional money for some of them. If you're a participant of the program, there's no more payment for any of the resources. Um, you'll see how all of those resources are going to be free for the participants of the uh, program. Okay, so um, Let's talk about the main topic for today's session. So today we want to talk about next generation sequencing in the context of infectious diseases. Um, and we have um, uh, some of these topics covered in today's session, which is going to be the next generation sequencing reads, sequences, what are the file formats that we're gonna be using, alignment, annotation, non-mapped reads, and then alignment on databases of viral genomes. So this is what we are going to be focused on today. Um, and I, as I mentioned before, we have a full project example on how to do that using Spotoptera frugiperda, which is a virus that infects a cell line culture that is used for vaccine production. So a concern for the uh, FDA. Uh, but before we jump to that project, let me kind of introduce everyone to some of the concepts and the topics uh, related to next generation sequencing. Uh, so next generation sequencing um, is a popular technique that has been used a lot for uh, viral, bacterial, and phage data. And so in 2009-2010 uh, review, a publication that we're going to share with you in the resources for today's session, uh, there was this chart that was published where we see that um, viruses and bacteria uh, as a percentage of growth and amount of sequence deposited on public domain databases um, has been significantly higher than uh, mammals. Um, and uh, it is important for us to understand what drives that uh, trend. And one of the important things that you will discover as you see as the number of sequences on GenBank uh, from different viruses is that primarily this has been driven by uh, pathogens that cause human disease. Um, and there are you know, benefits to that, but also limitations. On one hand, the benefit is that we uh, learn a lot more about the diversity of the viruses that cause human disease. On the other hand, we know that viruses, uh, they develop and evolve uh, and adapt to environmental 
um, as well as other host um, stresses. And so what we still have as, a, as an issue with that is that there's still a lot of unknowns. Uh, so we do have a lot more detailed information, genomic information about pathogens that cause human disease. We are still limited in how we're able to understand viruses in general. And one of the reasons for that is that there's just a lot more viruses um, than um, any other kinds of um, organisms. So uh, uh, that's one of the reasons. However, in recent outbreaks, we do see a tremendous growth in both the generation of genomic data about these pathogens, but also the availability um, and the rate of growth for this kind of information. I think this is an important trend for us to continue and look at because um, any kind of uh, research today is very data-driven and dependent on data in general. And so it's important, I think, for all of us involved in this kind of research to understand how exactly is next generation sequencing helping advance this genomic characterization of viral and bacterial uh, genomes um, and what we can do with this kind of information. So I hope that today's session will help us understand a little bit better what does all of this mean and what can we do with this kind of data. So today I wanted to talk about um, three aspects of next generation sequencing in the context of uh, infectious diseases. So an important part of it is uh, the data preparation. So we'll talk a little bit about different um, major groups of uh, data preparation techniques or library preparation techniques. Um, then there are several methods of analysis. So we'll talk about how this data is analyzed and of course different methods of sequencing, how um, different um, machines, instruments, uh, generate the data that we um, can analyze. So in general, there are three major types of metagenomic and viral sequencing. There's what's called targeted. Um, there's going to be total DNA or RNA um, or untargeted, and then amplicon and environmental. And the differences between them are that when we look for a specific type of a pathogen, for example, if we're looking for a specific virus, but we expect there to be some diversity in what we find, we can amplify, um, even if it's a virus with a short genome, and most of the viruses have fairly short genomes, we can amplify for that specific, uh, for those specific genomic regions that characterize that genome. And then what we expect to find from next generation sequencing is some of the diversity that we will find in the reads and perhaps discover that there are some variation in the one type, one strain of a virus, for example, that we're looking at. Uh, there's also um, an amplification of conserved regions. So for example, metagenomics is an uh, environmental approach where you take a sample directly from the environment. That environment could be uh, from feces, it could be from water, uh, it could be from uh, different soil, other types of environmental samples, and we can amplify specific conserved regions. For example, with bacteria, there are what's called hypervariable regions that are um, going to be unique to bacteria, but they have a certain aspect of variation uh, throughout the different uh, bacterial species and families and genera. And we can use that difference by looking at the composition of the different genomes that we have in an environmental sample. And then, of course, we have the total DNA and RNA. So, for example, if we take a sample from a host, from an animal, or from a human, we can generate the total um, RNA, for example, that is being expressed. And we will find that some of that RNA will represent some genes coming from bacteria or from viruses. So we can detect some of the viruses that way as well. In all of these cases, we will have to have some kind of a set of references, whether those are the amplified regions, whether those are the collection of genomes that we map on, or it's a database of maybe both or one of those. So some of the examples 
um, that again, we will discuss today. Um, for example, in viral outbreak methods, um, a lot of times we will have a direct clinical specimen. So for example, we'll have a specimen from a patient that could be an oral swab, um, that could be feces, that could be blood. Um, and then within that sequence, we are expecting to find some viral sequence. Now, the problem is that the quality of sequencing is directly related to the amount of virus that we actually have. And typically in a sample like that, we will have a very low amount of virus. And so one, one important part would be to amplify that viral sequence. And that's going to be done with PCR, um, where we will be able to focus on a specific strain. For example, if we already have a clinical information that a person has a certain virus, we might want to amplify anything related to that viral genome. And then we will be able to study variation. So haplotypes is what we would call that. Um, another way to look at it is to look for specific um, sequences that are typical to the viral polymerase, where we will be able to look at, in general, what kinds of viruses are present. And so that is going to be something typical for, for example, fecal um, metagenomic sequencing. Uh, we also have the ability to um, look for different microorganisms. So we, will, we might be looking for a combination of viral and bacterial, um, uh, viral and bacterial uh, genomes present in a sample, uh, where we might be looking for just detecting, for example, by separating everything that we have in a sample, we can separate for viral particles, for example, by their size, or bacteria by their size, and then extracting the DNA or RNA that is present inside, we are able to just focus the sequencing on those specific RNA or DNA elements. We also might use that to look for antibiotic resistance. So for example, we might be looking for specific genes, not whole genomes, but specific genes, for example, that are res uh, resistant to antibiotics. And that could be done for HIV, or that could be done for tuberculosis, they both have genes that are known to have specific mutations that can indicate resistance accumulating in, the, in that specific host. And then we also can look at microbiome analysis. So clinical metagenomics is ability to look at the different compositions of the microbiome and compare them to healthy individuals. So we can look at composition, we can look at presence or absence of specific uh, families or uh, uh, species of bacteria, and by comparison to understand that something is not right and then explore exactly what could be the reason for that. And that could be metagenomic genomic data, or that could be transcriptomic. So we might be looking at the transcriptomic, so the production of specific genes, or we can look at uh, patients, so the host response, right? Inflammation. Uh, and different kinds of genes that are associated with those um, processes could be studied at the transcriptomic level. So this is just a broad overview. There's a lot more detail in the papers that we will share with you after this session. Um, and uh, you can look a lot more in detail um, in those publications how that is done in a clinical um, or preclinical studies uh, to understand, for example, prevalence of different viral strains in different environments and different hosts, et cetera. Now, I do want to mention that for those that are interested to learn about metagenomics, uh, we have a course called um, Introduction to Metagenomics and then Metagenomics 1 that talks a lot about the sequencing approaches and some of the examples of how that sequencing information is used. Uh, to study microbiome or presence of specific types of um, bacteria and viruses. And we'll do a little practical example of that today as well. So one of the important aspects of uh, this kind of metagenomic uh, sequencing is the ability to uh, look at culture-free sequencing reads. So not have bacteria first cultured and grown in, in a lab environment that is, of course, non-natural, 
but looking directly at uh, the sample and amplifying for those specific hypervariable regions that could uh, give us a very good sense of microbiome composition. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the data formats for sequencing data. Uh, the three major formats that we'll talk about today uh, are the FASTQ files, the FASTA files, and the GTF files. FASTQ files contain sequencing reads, and those sequencing reads have uh, short between uh, 20 and 300 base pair long uh, sequences with quality information. So the Q here stands for quality, something to remember. FASTA files contain the full genomic information about, uh, for example, a, uh, a virus or a bacteria or even a human genome could all be uh, stored in a FASTA format. And typically that would be longer sequences. And those longer sequences will contain, for example, information about different chromosomes and things like that. At a greater detail, for example, when we look at specific genes or variation of those genes, isoforms, exons, and others, that kind of uh, information will be contained in a GTF file, which is essentially just a position of start and end for each uh, genomic element that we can map the reads to uh, on the sequence side and then know some metadata about the segment that we have covered, for example, or not covered. So when we talk about having a viral genome that is produced by uh, sequencing, next generation sequencing, uh, which by the way, not always is produced by next generation sequencing from Illumina, it could be other types of sequencers um, or even um, RT-PCR. So, but when we talk about next generation sequencing, this is an example of short reads aligned to the reference genome of this novel coronavirus uh, from COVID 2019. And there's a few things that you see here, um, including the different reads. So the short lines right here are the different reads. You can see coverage, how different reads are aligned to the reference genome. And you can see that some are, have more coverage than others. And then you see the position on the genome right here from one to about 30,000. But at the end, what we get, and this, this information would be contained in a FASTQ file. So all of the reads would be contained in the FASTQ files. At the end of this, what we see is typically a FASTA file. So here you see an example of a FASTA file that has the full genome, and that's just a continuous sequence. Even though we, we know that the genome contains specific regions, and those are going to be characterized in a GTF file. So again, FASTA file is just going to be a complete sequence and we use it for reference. And the FASTQ will have specific reads plus the quality information inside each read. Once we have this information, one of the first steps that we would typically do is align those to each other. So for example, here you see an alignment to the reference of individual reads. And what you see is that they stack up, right? Why do they stack up? Because they don't all start at the same beginning, but they eventually stack up. And that is what represents coverage. So we will, we will see this in a second, how um, these uh, reads help us identify changes from the reference genome and how they can help us study those specific regions with greater detail. So there's also going to be two types of sequencing. There's single end read and pair end reads. A lot of the metagenomic sequencing is going to be done with paired end reads. Um, and paired end read sequencing is more um, precise because we have uh, longer reads that are aligned in different directions to each other. And so we have a higher confidence in the actual sequence of the read. And we also know um, where the read ends 
and starts and where's the overlap. So that's just something to remember as we will start uploading files, you will see how it's important to understand whether a FASTQ file was generated from single end or paired end read sequences. Now this, as you see, is a BAM file, right? So it's another file format. So what is this file format? The SAM or the BAM file, uh, which is essentially the same thing, um, is encoded in such a way that we can visualize all of the reads. So we will have all of the location, the beginning and the end for each read, and how it aligns to the reference genome. So here you can see an example of a, uh, of a number of reads aligned to a chromosome of the human chromosome to the genome GRCH38. And there are some free tools. Uh, there's actually many free tools that you can use to visualize that kind of uh, BAM or SAM file. So after the alignment, you will get a BAM or a SAM file that you can download. And that is something that you can either open on your computer, um, I do want to caution you that those files are going to be pretty big, or you can use an online visualization uh, solution that will help you visualize how that works. Now, what would that look like? This is what it would look like. For example, as we do today's assignments, we will look at uh, something that looks like this. So what do we see here? We see here actually uh, um, an alignment on the um, tuberculosis genome, uh, which is about 4 million base pairs long, of reads. And you can see that they accumulate in a specific region. So to know this region, we would have to have the GTF file that tells us the different genomic uh, elements in this genome. This is called coverage. Coverage shows you, in general, how many reads cover a specific region. And then you have uh, the actual alignment of reads. And here you can see the blue and the red, which are the two different directions, positive and uh, opposite direction, um, and reads that do not have a uh, matching pair. So the ones that, even though all of this is paired end reads, some of them don't have a pair. OK, so this is just a general overview of the different files, the different formats, and um, an understanding of the process of alignment. So before we move forward, I want to make sure that we answer any questions. And after this, if you have any questions, you can put that in chat. After this, we will actually do a practical assignment so that everybody can get a feel for what this looks like in real life. OK, um, so a question, what if you don't know which virus bacteria is in the sample so you don't have a reference? That's an excellent question. If you don't know what you're looking for, how do you know that it's there, right? And so we will we'll do an example exactly for that. So we will take a metagenomic sequence file uh, that we will align to a whole database. So we'll talk a little bit about all of the uh, available genomes are collected on the NCBI virus database, or there are some uh, databases specifically designed for those hypervariable regions in bacteria. Um, so those are two types of metagenomic sequences, sequencing. Um, or sometimes we will also have, uh, for example, a sample from the host transcriptome, right, expression of genes, and we can look at not mapped reads, the reads that do not map on the host uh, reference genome. And then we can look for viruses or bacteria present in those as well. So we'll talk about these three different examples now in a second. OK, does anyone else have any other questions about what we talked about so far? And is everyone familiar with, uh, uh, with the different um, file formats that we've talked about? OK, Q4. Another question. Um, SRA file is the same to BAM or SAM. So SRA file is actually um, a, uh, an archive. So it's an archive typically of FASTQ files. Uh, SAM or BAM files are files that come out from, uh, from alignment. So it's the secondary 
version of those files. Okay, so yes, uh, if, uh, if you do not have your account information, please let us know. Okay, so for now, um, I'm just going to um, share some of the um, some of the uh, um, uh, publications that I referenced today. So you can take a look at some of these publications. There's only three. I think they are informative. They provide a good overview. Uh, for example, application of next generation sequencing technologies in virology. Um, there is also a publication here on a diagnostic uh, based on whole genome sequencing. Um, and then a review of viral metagenomics. Of course, there's a lot of other useful um, reference publications that we'll be talking about throughout this whole program. Um, but this is something that I wanted to share with everyone. Uh, the way that this works is you'll get a Dropbox link basically uh, with the PDF uh, files there, so you don't have to search for them. I also, um, for this next session, will use several files. Um, obviously, this is something that you will um, be able to use after you've completed the registration effectively, but some of you might want to uh, follow along in any case. So I'm just going to paste the link here as well. So, and let me explain what are these files. So the second link is the link to the files. So here we have, uh, we'll just do a very um, basic example, but I think it will uh, give you a sense of how these different file formats work together and what you can do with them. Uh, we have an SRA file, that's essentially a fast Q file that's compressed uh, of some metagenomic sequencing. Uh, there is a reference genome for Ebola virus. And then there is a table after annotation. So this is just a table of the different found uh, viruses uh, from this metagenomic uh, sample. And we'll do this analysis together so you get a sense of how this works. Okay, so the first step is to get to the server, which will look like this. Um, this is, okay, let me exit here actually. Uh, this is the link to get to the server. So yes, thank you, Bibsha. So if you have your account, you should be logged in like this. So you can see my email address right here. Um, and you um, should be able to get inside. Now, some of you might have demo accounts right now. If you have a demo account, you can still follow along for most of the things that we're going to be doing. The only difference is that you cannot upload any files. So really what we'll be doing today is this section right here, metagenomics microbiome. And if you want to just click through on the demo, um, you'll be able to click right here and pressing on these buttons will explain some of the example data set and what you can do with that uh, by clicking on the buttons that show up after that. And yes, you will have a copy of this recording after the session. Okay, for those of you that do have the login information, if you can click just right here, and by the way, if you have any questions on what these different sections mean or what they do, you can hover over uh, these little eye icons and you'll see um, what they provide inside. Okay, so metagenomics microbiome. Let's do a brief overview of what we see here. On top, we see the option to upload data. So as I mentioned, it's important to know, do you have a reference genome that is just a FASTA file or do you also have a GTF file? Um, it's important to know what kind of data format you're going to be uploading. For example, we'll be using FASTQ files. Um, and then paired end or single end reads. So first of all, how do we know what are we gonna be working with? The file that we'll be using today is a file taken from uh, NCBI. So this is the link to the file. And you can read about the uh, method of sequencing that they used here. So you can see that this is metagenomic sequencing with spiked primer enrichment. 
And if you search for this, uh, uh, this is an actual paper that explains how they did it. I actually believe uh, this is the paper right here if you're interested. So um, this sample um, right here is a run, right? So how do you actually get this file? How do you download it from SRA? If you click right here on file and then click here on run info, create a file, you will have, um, it will download a file to your computer. And let's take a look at what's inside. And inside you'll find a lot of useful information of what this uh, file actually contains. So you see that there's a name, there's a release and load date and et cetera, all kinds of technical information. And then here you'll have a download link. So if you take this link and just copy it and uh, paste it here and press enter, it will download that whole file. Now that whole file will come without an ending. It will not have you know, dot anything at the end. And so to, um, to fix that, you just have to rename it and add dot SRA. Do not change it to fastq, make it dot SRA. Now I already downloaded that file and put it in Dropbox link. So if you wanna just go and take it from there. For those of you that have research accounts, you can directly upload this file. For those of you that have an educational account, in the next session, I will explain how to manage the data sets that you will work with throughout this course. It will be using reference links to data that is already uploaded. So you don't have to actually upload these big files, which are not allowed with an educational account. Okay, so just wanted to make sure that all of that is clear. Okay, let's look at what this is, you can see that the strategy is Amplicon. So what they're using is actually a way to amplify for specific sequences to be able to detect different viruses. And so here, if you read more about this, they were focused on some of the commonly uh, suspected and uh, dangerous viruses that uh, you might be wanting to find. And so we'll take a look at how that works after we run this pipeline. Okay, another thing uh, to remember here, so let's change this to FastQ. Another thing to remember here is what will we be um, actually aligning our sequence to? And so here we'll choose virus genomes because we wanna use a database of virus genomes. Okay, so this is the analysis that we will do today. Um, can I just ask if you can let me know um, that everyone got to this page on server and is able to log in. So just if you are logged in, you can put yes in chat. No, okay. So Claudia is not able to log in. Grace Panduka is not. Okay, so for those of you that are not able to log in, um, Bipsha, if you could just take the names of the people that still don't have their login information so we can follow up with them. Okay, so uh, that's good to know. Thank you for letting us know. We will actually go through the list today and make sure that everybody that has finalized the registration can log in um, and has the information. And, and then we will also send you this recording so that you can try and repeat uh, the steps that we did here. In the, so please make sure that you, you, know, you are getting emails from marketing at pine.bio. Uh, without getting those emails, you'll not be able to do a lot of the things that we plan for the program. Um, okay, so thank you for letting us know. Okay, so what is this virus uh, uh, database. Essentially, um, the database on NCBI has a collection of all sorts of viruses that people have submitted from different projects around the world. So one of the requirements, for example, for getting grants, if you do kind of any kind of sequencing, you have to submit that sequencing. And there are separate repositories. So there is a repository, for example, for uh, FASTQ files, and uh, there's a repository for FASTA files 
for assembled genomes. There's also a repository for different partial sequencing of different viruses. So here are a couple of links that you can look at for all the different types of viruses that are categorized by host, uh, by virus type, uh, by type of sequencing, et cetera. So you can take a look at a couple of these links. There's also a more structured database called the Reference Viral Database, RVDB, uh, which is actually validated. And you will see that validation and characterization of these viral sequences by people is an important part of having a high quality result in the end. Okay, so what we will select is virus genomes, which is going to be just that uh, NCBI virus database. Okay, what will we do next? So just an overview before we actually go ahead and do it. The overview is we will take this FASTQ file. So we upload the SRA. The SRA will be unpacked, so unarchived. Inside that SRA file, this, this FASTQ file could be opened in a text format, so any text editor. And you will see that inside there are reads, and it says what the length of the read is, uh, and has the sequence of the read, and what is the quality of the sequence. And that will be done by the start button. So we'll just do this in a second together. Then we will align the sequences. So these read sequences, we will align them to the reference database and generate an abundance table. And this table will look like this. So we'll actually see here the different NC is an accession number in the viral database. And we'll be able to look at these different names of accession numbers and understand what kind of viruses are present in this metagenomic sequence. And so after this, we'll do a different pipeline to actually visualize what we have found. So let's go ahead and create this pipeline together. Okay, so we selected here virus genomes. Here we have single end because single end sequencing. Um, our model genome, we actually don't need a genome. So we're not going to map it on any kind of reference. And this is FASTQ. Then we click on file upload. Here, we can use several ways of uploading files. And I'll go into more in-depth explanation of this next time because we're running out of time. But I can essentially upload a file um, uh, from my computer, from NCBI directly, or using a reference. So I'm just going to put here. Okay, then you will see that this file is already uploaded. I don't need, I'm not comparing any groups, so I'm just going to say cancel. When I press on start, it explains how this type of analysis is done. You can see that some of the buttons light up. Those are the ones that are available to me after the type of data that I upload and the, up, and the selection that I do. So I will choose here both to align. I'm going to align on the reference database. And then I'm going to just generate uh, a table that shows me all of the present viruses that I have. And I'll click on end. So after I create my pipeline, I can name it. And so if you want us to help you by tracking your pipeline, just keep this name somehow relevant and easy to find. There's a lot of you and we will be taking the time to review these pipelines. So for example, I'll name mine Elia, you know, pipeline metagenomics one. And then you'll be able to run your pipeline. So don't forget, you don't just create a pipeline and leave, you have to run the pipeline. Um, yeah, so uh, the reference for demo was actually um, a different file. Again, uh, what we will use today is um, one second. Yeah, for those of you that have an educational account, you have to um, 
you have to use the SVL. Um, yeah, so I will actually email you a clear direction on how to do this. I just had it saved for me, but I'll email you a, a link. Um, and then you run the pipeline. Okay, so after you run that pipeline, I'm not gonna do it because I already ran the pipeline. So I just wanted today to kind of give everybody an overview of how this works. So let's take a look at my pipelines. You'll see, for example, that I ran this pipeline right here. And, and right now I'll uh, actually give you that link. So you can see that I ran this pipeline. Um, here I have all of the links that I used here. So let me quickly give you that link. This is uh, a link to all of the uh, repository files. Okay, and actually it is right here. So for those of you that wanted to run this pipeline, if you do have an educational account, that is where that FASTQ file is, or that is where the SRA is. But what happens is essentially it extracts the SRA and creates a FASTQ file. So that's the file that you can use. Okay, and let's take a look at what's in the actual main output here. So you would go to download um, the main download folder, and you have a few different files that are output here. So you can see, uh, that there's going to be an annotation file, uh, there's going to be mapping statistics, and this is the table that we're looking for. So what is inside that table? As I explained, there's going to be a list of the different viral sequences that were found after you map. And what you can do is you can just go and take this NC accession number, go to NCBI, Select your nucleotide because that's where it came from and search for that, for that accession number. So here, for example, that this is a phage, right? What is a phage? It's a virus that infects bacteria. So these are going to be the most present ones. And eventually, as you go through, you will see that some of the human viruses are also going to be present here in this sequence. So what's important for us is that we have found one of these that is going to be very concerning, right? It's Ebola. So we actually found a presence of some Ebola virus in uh, a sequence. And so that's a concern for us. So what we want to do next is we want to take all of these reads and map them onto the reference of Ebola virus, okay? Just to understand what portion of that was covered. Right, so let's just do that quickly together so we understand how that works. That could be done in a number of different sections, but what we will do is we will go to a section dedicated to analysis of genomic data. So right here under genomics epigenetics, right, we expect this to be a sequence of a genome. So we'll go to mutation variant, parallel analysis of mutation variant data, Again, these are SE, so single end. We will only do a reference genome. We're not going to upload a GTF file. And this, this is going to be a FASTQ file. Notice that you can also upload here SAM or BAM files. Okay, let's go to file upload. So now we use that link that I gave you again. Oh, sorry this link that I pasted in chat, right? We just paste it right here. And now we need to upload, and this will be allowed for your educational account as well because it's a small file. We will actually upload the Ebola virus. So where is that Ebola virus? That is in the Dropbox folder that I gave you, uh, Bioinformatics for Infectious Diseases. data and then you'll see that there's a genome from Ebola Zaire from 2015. So you choose that file, you see that it's uploaded to 100% and then you can do continue and we actually don't need any groups because we're not comparing any sequences. We'll do that next time, we'll compare sequences. But here all we want to do is upload our data and then 
map it onto the reference genome this time because we already detected that that genome is there right by mapping on a database of viruses we'll click on save and we'll just click on visualization so we'll visualize how do the reads that we have map on this reference database and then you click on end and again remember to save the pipeline with some kind of a name. Again, I'm not going to run this myself because I already ran it. What instead I want to do is show you the output as we're approaching the end of this session. Okay, so here's the pipeline, just exactly like what I showed you, right? We upload the data, map on the reference genome, generate a visualization and click on end. And there, here you will have a link to visualization. And that visualization is using JBrowse, and it looks like this. Okay, remember, this is to illustrate what type of sequencing technique was used here. So this is an amplicon sequencing technique. What it does is it amplifies certain regions that are specific to the viral polymerase of different viruses that we're, we're careful not to have in typical patient samples. And here's what you can see as the result. So this is the reference genome, LN877955.1. Uh, it is the sequence of Ebola virus, which is about 19,000 kilobases, 19,000 bases long. Um, and these are, this is the coverage, so very small coverage, right, um, across this short section of the reference genome. If we zoom in, you can actually see, start seeing the sequence down here. Okay, and I'm just going to give you the link to this visualization if you want to explore and not wait for your pipeline. So this is the, the link. If you just click on that link, you should be able to see what I see. So please let me know if you're able to see that. It will take a little bit of time to load, but you should be able to see it. All right, great, thank you, Martin. So this is JBrowse. JBrowse is one of those free tools that you can use to visualize the results of alignment on a reference genome. Right now, we took a very simple analysis, right? All we did was we mapped a short portion of those reads that we downloaded from NCBI onto the Ebola virus genome. Great, looks like everybody's able to see it. So just let's make sure that we understand what we see here. We see a very small number of reads and those reads are aligned to the reference genome. And here we see the total coverage for this portion. Here we see the reference genome sequence. And remember that these are nucleotides that are translated to amino acids. And so the changes in different nucleotides will cause a change potentially in the amino acid, and that is going to be the functional structural change. So we'll talk a lot about all of these different things later. But what was important in this session is for us to be able to get to this point and know that, one, we understand the different file formats. So what format are we looking at? Let me ask you this question. What are we seeing here visualized? What file format? Is it the GTF file? Is it the FASTA file? Is it the FASTQ file? Or is it the BAM file? BAM, all right. GTF, BAM, BAM. BAM, yes, so the correct answer is BAM. Thank you for answering. Those of you that are looking at some of the other ones, let's just quickly review. So yes, you have elements from the GTF file that are actually not uploaded, right? So if we did upload a GTF file, we would see here position of individual genes. So we don't have the GTF file. This is what's inside the FASTA file. It's just this sequence right here. 
What's inside the FASTQ file? Just these individual reads. But the BAM file, as you can see right here, BAM alignment, right? That aligns these different FASTQ sequences to the FASTA reference genome and provides us with a sense of coverage. Excellent. So all of you now understand next generation sequencing. All of you now know what we're looking at. Let's go back to our presentation. So we're running out of time, so I'm just going to run through some of the other slides that I had here. So what, we, what you can do to go through this process in detail again um, and look at how this is applied to one example is to look at this project on Spotoptera frugiperida, which is a viral contamination of a cell line that is used for the production of biologics. Biologics can include insulin as a biologic or a vaccine as a biologic, right? So different types of naturally occurring proteins that are produced using cell lines. Uh, this is a project that uh, describes how you can understand contamination and how you can use the exact same uh, type of analysis that we did here by mapping on a reference database, finding what types of viruses could be present, and how do we know what is actually of concern um, using that example. Okay, so uh, this is a free course. Those of you that have registered for the program can take it. Those of you that have not yet registered and want to get a better sense of what we're going to be doing, you can also take that project as well. What are we going to cover in our next session? As you saw, some of those positions were highlighted, right? Some of those positions look like they were different from the reference genome. So we are going to talk about multiple sequence alignment next time. How are we going to use this information that we have of all of the reads and all the reference genome nucleotide sequences to understand variation and doing that using multiple sequence alignments? Again, it's going to be a practical session. We'll do a little bit of an introduction. I ask that by next time, for those of you that are not familiar with the uh, nucleotides or amino acids or um, you know, some of these sequencing formats, you start looking at some of those courses that we have. We have several courses that could be helpful. Introduction to genomics. Genomics one could be helpful. Um, uh, transcriptomics one could be helpful for understanding different formats as well. So start taking a look at those courses. Uh, Spotoptera frugiperida will cover some of this as well, so you can take a look at that. What did we learn in this session? In this session, we looked at sequencing. What are reads? How is the sequencing done? What are some of the different file formats? How is alignment performed? We talked a little bit about how uh, we have different types of reads. Some of them map, some of them don't map. Uh, and how do we uh, map on the uh, databases of viral genomes? I hope that this was helpful and gives you a good uh, review of some of the basic terms and you feel more ready for the program as we're getting started here. Uh, at this point, if you have any questions, I'm happy to spend another few minutes to um, answer any uh, questions that you might have. Do the pipeline will do assembly and annotation at same time if we use the reference genome? Okay, so those are two different um, two different things that need to be done. When we just have one reference genome, we are not doing assembly. We're actually just mapping reads on the best location on that reference genome. When do we do need to use assembly? When we have a database of genomes, there's going to be a lot of similar uh, sequences in the different genomes. And to find the best position, the longer the sequence that we're trying to map, the best we can evaluate what is the optimal mapping. And so that's when assembly is needed. Another way we can think about assembly is when we look at transcriptomic data. We actually have to uh, assemble the transcriptome uh, to understand what kinds of expression of isoforms and, and other variation happens. So assembly is a little bit of a different uh, approach. What assembly does is looks at overlapping reads 
or reads that contain elements of each other and combines them into contigs. So these are continuous sequences assembled from multiple reads. Uh, there's a number of different approaches for that that we'll talk a little bit more later. Um, but those are separate tasks and not always used together. Okay, any, any other questions? Okay, if anyone has any technical questions, how to register, how to make sure that you can access your account, uh, how to upload files, um, anything like that, uh, please ask Bipsha, marketing at pine.bio. Thank you, Bipsha, right there. This recording will be posted on the forum. This recording and the previous recording will also be posted on the forum. Okay, another quick question here, fast files, are they created by the user? So someone who does the sequencing creates a fast Q file, and then that fast Q file could be assembled into a genome, and that would be a FASTA file. Those assembled genomes are typically curated by people that check um, those files and understand how they were assembled, et cetera. Sometimes FASTA files could be created from uh, RT-PCR, they could be created from um, other types of like Sanger sequencing, et cetera. So um, there's many different ways to generate a FASTA file, which is a sequence of a genome or a region that is submitted to NCBI. Okay, so if you have any technical questions, please ask Bipsha, email us. If you um, uh, are uh, already in the program, please update your profile. Make sure that we actually have your real name um, and uh, any information you would like to share with us. You will see how this will become useful as we progress in this program. Uh, we have provided you with access to some of the course material and project material, so please take a look at that. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again next time, which is going to be, uh, which is going to be May 7th. So we, we look forward to seeing you um, May 7th. Again, it's going to be on Zoom. So please join us next time. Thank you everyone for joining today. Thank you.